Welcome everybody on this very nice uh, Friday. So it's, uh, we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Andrew Hansen with us. He's going to talk about development and translation of products for veterans made by MAID. Dr. Hansen received his bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa in biomedical engineering and also his master's and PhD degree uh, from uh, bio Northwestern in biomedical engineering. Uh, Dr. Hansen and Dr. Goldis founded the MAID program, um, which has grown to have more than 25 multidisciplinary scientists and engineers um, in two, 2021. Uh, also, Professor Hansen is, uh, is Professor of Rehabilitation Science and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. So without further ado, Andrew, the podium is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here, tell you a little bit about the work we're doing at the VA, uh, as well here at the University of Minnesota. And um, so, yeah, my, my primary role is at the VA hospital. I'm a career, career um, employee here, research biomedical engineer, uh, but also uh, of affiliations with the university. Uh, must acknowledge funding sources without work. Without funding, it's hard to do much work. So uh, these, these are the groups that have been funding our work, primarily VA and the Department of Defense. Uh, our lab is here at the Minneapolis VA healthcare system. So we're uh, short right on the train from campus to where I'm, I'm at right now. And um, it's a very large medical center. There are several major clinical rehabilitation centers here at the VA in Minneapolis, including Regional Amputation Center, which is the highest tier of care for amputees, Polytrauma Rehab Center, one of five, <clears throat> Spinal Cord Injuries and Disorder Center, we're one of 25, and then a Geriatric Research Education <clears throat> and Clinical Center, <clears throat> excuse me, which is also within our uh, rehab um, department. Uh, our group is now about this large. We The top layer are all, all PIs. Uh, many are engineers. Uh, one is a nurse scientist, uh, medical doctors, psychologists, et cetera. So very multidisciplinary team. We have design designers. We have research clinicians, study coordinators, and, and several students. And I saw Tian Chu Zhang who is one of our students um, last year. So it's great to see your, great to see your name here uh, in the robotics group. So, uh, the mission of MADE is really to develop and disseminate adaptive technologies and interventions that help veterans maximize their participation and function. And here it says function and participation, but we're actually thinking of changing this. Participation really is being able to do the things that you wanna do. Uh, in your life, uh, whether that's work, go to school, um, anything that's meaningful to you. We want to make sure veterans are able to do these things. <clears throat> and often we can do that by improving their function. Uh, some of the things that really are overarching themes for us are, are uh, we focus on development and translation of technologies that maximize participation, maximize function, and do so in a way that prevents or mitigates complications of disabilities. So this last one's important. Basically complications of, of different disabilities can really take you out of the things you wanna do. So today I'm gonna to show just a few projects that we've been working on <clears throat> since, uh, since the lab started about 10 years ago. Uh, some in lower limb prosthetics, wheelchair, design, exercise equipment, and a skin screening technology. And the key thing with all of these is that we must have clinicians involved or basically at the driving wheel of these projects uh, because we really wanna avoid being engineers run amok. Uh, you may have seen um, presentations from engineers working with no clinicians and um, so, sometimes that can work, but often it's, it's not a great idea. 
uh, unless maybe they have a clinical background themselves. So the first one I'll talk about is a slope adaptive ankle foot system. And we're working on this because we have uh, many veterans with lower limb amputations and current prostheses do not adapt for slope terrain. They're set up and they work really well on a level terrain. And then when you start walking on slopes, they're very um, unstable. Um, some adapt, but they do it after like taking measurements with sensors and then it decides, hey, we're on a different terrain, let's change our alignment. Uh, this is not good if you're on terrain that's you know, changing all the time. They, they have delays and, and many of these things use damping control, which just sucks energy out of the system, uh, which is not what you want when you're walking around. So, and then most don't provide plantar flexion and laid stance. So they don't really give this kind of push off effect uh, like the normal ankle. Uh, this work kind of dates back to my PhD work um, where I looked at a lot of uh, just normal or neurotypical ankle function. And um, at normal slash fast walking speeds, 1.2 to 1.6 meters per second, the ankle follows this sort of path. This is a torque angle relationship of the ankle. And what we said here is maybe we could mimic this if we took a system with a low stiffness uh, neutralizing springs for this first part, and then had a stiffer spring that we could engage at foot flat of walking. So as soon as the foot hits the ground, if we start engaging this spring, we could try to mimic this behavior. So initially this was a bit of an academic exercise, but what we kind of found out right away is that if you follow this approach, this will automatically adapt to different slopes, which is actually probably way more important than the fact that it's mimicking the torque angle relationship. So, um, because people really are unstable on different slopes. So we went through many different uh, design um, iterations of this. This is probably about the third, third or fourth iteration that was built here at the VA in Minneapolis. It's a purely mechanical system. Uh, there's a, uh, a cam lock system here one, it's a basically a one-way clutch that's weight activated. And then the neutralizing element is in the back. So when someone steps down, they push this down, it brings this cam up into the ring, and now it's a one-way clutch. And when they take weight off of the, the limb, uh, that disengages the clutch. So um, this is the concept of it. And um, this is it actually working. So this is movie slowed down by seven times. Um, uh, one seventh of full speed, I should say. So you can see here the foot kind of finds the surface, stores energy in this foot plate, get that back and then picks itself up for swing phase. And this is going down a fairly steep uh, treadmill in the laboratory. And so gait analyses show the ankle adapted to different slopes and it provides a slate stance plantar flexion. And, but probably more importantly, people say it's way more comfortable when walking on slopes. And if you can imagine an ankle that's not adapting uh, to the slope, it causes a lot of uh, torque on the residual limb in the socket and makes it very uncomfortable to walk. And uh, they also reported less effort to walk on the slopes. So uh, this is some of the gait analysis data. If you look at torque angle for the usual prosthesis, it basically stays on the same uh, pattern here um, because it's, it's just, it's a line to one uh, angle and, it, and it's basically a spring. Uh, this system changes its alignment. So it's going toward dorsiflexion for uphill, plantar flexion for downhill. And if you look kind of at the, angles as a percent versus percent gait cycle, you can kind of see that it's basically just shifting the set point of the ankle um, movements. Uh, since that time, so this, this all worked and was fun, but the problem is when this thing releases, it makes a snapping noise like that. And so uh, that's very 
unacceptable if you're using a prosthesis that uh, every time your right foot uh, goes into swing phase, it makes a big clicking sound. So um, that was one problem we wanted to change. And, and then there's some other reasons to maybe try a different approach that's, that's, um, uh, that we've gone toward this approach, which is now a hydraulic slope adaptive uh, foot or what we call equifoot. foot. And basically the kind of neutralizing spring is here. Um, you find the surface and um, the key to this is this element in red, which at toe off needs to allow flow to happen. So um, we, we started working with a company on this about three or four years ago. Um, and we're now, they've now licensed the device in um, just late September of 2021. So we should see this uh, product hit the market, uh, we hope, in another year or two. So that, that's one example. Another uh, product we're working on is has to do with the fact that prosthetics are really designed for one foot, one heel height shoe. <clears throat> and if you want to deviate from that, the alignment of the prosthesis is way off. So you can kind of see this, the prosthetic leg is well aligned for this shoe. Try like a, a, a low heeled shoe or a high heeled shoe. And now you're standing in a very awkward posture or trying to walk with that. So <clears throat> for able-bodied women, the primary adaptation when walking with high heeled shoes is at the ankle joint. This is part of my PhD work trying to understand many of the different features of walking uh, and how we could use how the neurotypical system reacts to these differences uh, to design prostheses. So basically neurotypical women walking in these three shoes will primarily just change the ankle motion uh, into more plantar flexion for the high heeled shoe. And the knee and hip really don't change that much. So in terms of prosthesis design, that means we can probably focus just here, as well as trying to make a foot that actually fits in these shoes. So there are some systems out on the market which allow you to push a button and rotate a, a foot uh, to fit into different shoes of different heel height. Uh, but because of the shape of the foot really doesn't change, uh, they, they only have a limited range of heel heights they can, they can adapt for. Um, and there's, there's about three, or three to five of these on the market. <clears throat> they all work pretty much in the same way. And we think that that's a big problem, especially if you're trying to get into a shoe like this, which many women veterans want to wear. Um, you can see this, this foot would be highly unstable in this shoe. It doesn't match the shape of the shoe at all. Um, now, there's, you know, some nice ideas have, have been in the literature on, on this particular aspect. One back from 1991, uh, when a prosthetist said, I'm going to create sort of an extra shim on top of a foot so that uh, the prosthesis user can unbolt it and bolt the other foot on. And this is a huge deal, actually, for two patients that he did this for. Um, one patient wrote, you know, can't tell you what this means to me. It's liberating. It's uh, greatly increased my self-confidence. And the other one talked about the ability to now go out and walk four and a half miles a day with, you know, People just are happier to get out and do things. Um, and and I will, I'll, I'll also say we recently did a survey and found that body image is a very strong correlator with participation. So if you do not like your body image, you're less likely to get out and do the things that you wanna do. So um, 
Another project I, I helped with was this one where we created very low cost feet. And we were really focused on trying to match the shape of the foot to the shoes and then uh, design the flexibility into the keel of the foot. These are just saw cuts into this piece of plastic. And um, uh, we were able to make feet between zero and seven centimeters. We were made a flexible keel, interchangeable feet, similar to the uh, art price example. And the concept was really appreciated by three women who tried this in Scotland. So Margaret Meyer was the PI in Scotland working with us. The only issue is that you take a foot like this with a flexible keel, so it's, well, one of the issues is that uh, you put that in a shoe now where this is totally inflexible. Um, and basically the rollover shape or the rollover kind of um, response is that you get sort of the force here and then like it quickly runs to the forefoot so there's this big flat region, which is not really great for walking. So the other big problem here is that even if the keels are sort of like adaptable for different sizes, the cosmetic cover that has to go over this, you can imagine the number of molds you need. If you need, if you need eight different heel heights, you need five different foot sizes, you need rights, lefts. Uh, what if you need different foot widths? Right, the number of molds you need uh, for a company to actually do this is is ridiculous and um, cost prohibitive. So um, the VA sees this as a very important area of research. Um, women veterans is a growing population of the of the veteran population, and oftentimes prosthetics research is. Uh, underserving basically women veterans. So our concept is more so that um, somebody gets shoes they really want to use, they go to their clinic, the prosthetist measures some aspects of the shoe, primarily the heel height of the shoe. These get sent to a company which then 3D prints the feet that fit perfectly in these shoes. And these get shipped back to the clinic and off you go. So now the idea is that <clears throat> instead of having these modular flexible keeled feet, you have one ankle where you build in the, 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 the primary function of the system, but that can quickly uh, drop, drop into these different feet. So uh, we've been working on this with funding from the VA and this shows uh, some feet 3D printed in nylon. And then um, <clears throat> ankle design that we drop into these feet. And, um, and basic ideas like this, it drops in right now, you know, in this design, we, oops, sorry, in this design, we were using a, a screw to just keep it from falling off. But the socket design itself is really enough to, to handle everything during stance phase. Um, we're now working with a company where we're trying to get rid of all that and just have this done completely with no tools. Um, the ankle, this is really a big part of the design is how to make this ankle functional, but very small so that you can fit into very small feet and very small feet with very high heels. Uh, when you get to a very small foot with a very high heel, it leaves very little space uh, to sort of drop this ankle inside. And so it's, it's pretty simple. It's a wiper design. There are a couple of bumpers on both sides here uh, that are used. And the idea is instead of changing shoes, now change feet and shoes. So if you're walking around in this one and now you wanna go out on the town, you just take the prosthesis out of this foot and drop it into the higher heel foot. So, uh, one big key element of this is the uh, digital foot model. So created by Eric Nickel and our group. And um, it's a parametric model that really only needs the heel height of the shoe and the foot length. And it automatically creates a 3D model of a foot that would fit that shoe. So this is really probably the, the most um, uh, 
just really outstanding work of this project is this model. And, and uh, this is showing a 2D thing, but he's, this is done in um, SolidWorks. Uh, also, this is, this is Nicole Walker, who is a certified prosthetist orthodist, as well as a PhD student in, in my lab. Uh, you know, demonstrating how these can, we can walk on these. They're, um, and um, she and I are now designing a study of this system uh, to hopefully start next year. Uh, this one also has been licensed to a company. This is licensed to Unique. And Unique specializes in 3D printing and prosthetics. Uh, up to now, they've really focused on like the covers that go around the prosthesis, as well as have done some work in uh, 3D printed sockets. And <clears throat> this will be their first prosthetic foot that they'll have on the market. So we are uh, in a collaborative research and development agreement with Unique, and uh, we're working together to, to um, get this product released next year. So um, now moving on to wheelchairs. Um, this project began uh, when I came here to Minneapolis. I, I really hit it off with a physician named Gary Goldbush, who ultimately he and I started this, this lab together. And um, he had, his, his primary um, patient is a spinal cord injury patient. And so, um, there are many reasons why persons with spinal cord injury, that it's good for them to stand. Um, it's good for pressure relief on their tissues that are often sitting. It is good for uh, range of motion of the joints it's, and it's good for several other things. And it's just psychologically good uh, for people find uh, psych psychosocial benefits to standing. So many things are out there like standing frames where people can stand. Many of these don't go anywhere. This one's totally stable. This one, somebody could push you around if you wanted. This one has some, the ability to move around but it's very, very uh, difficult to get anywhere. Um, there are standing wheelchairs on the market. Uh, there are heavy, very expensive powered standing wheelchairs that allow you to stand and also allow you to be mobile while standing. Um, there are also um, manual standing wheelchairs that allow you to stand, but once you stand, you're stuck in place. So uh, this comes down and basically you're, you're not able to move anywhere. So what Dr. Goldish wanted to do is create a manual standing wheelchair that's mobile in a standing position. And the reason is he had several patients that had adequate upper limb um, abilities, but also had jobs that required them to stand, but like to stand over here and then to stand over there. And, and each time with a chair like this, they would have to sit down and move around. Um, but because they had good upper limb strength, he was not able to prescribe a powered wheelchair for these people. So, so basically that's the reason for doing this. Uh, um, so this was our first, um, this was our first prototype of the mobile manual standing wheelchair. And the idea is that the, uh, there's a two chain drive system. You can move around while sitting. And this is a veteran with a spinal cord injury showing this. And then you can go through a series of movements to get to standing. Uh, and then you're able to move around while standing. <clears throat> so we developed this wheelchair with uh, funding from the Paralyzed Veterans of America and um, it was well received uh, by veterans in a focus group uh, who also told us, you know, what we need to do to make it, make it better. So 
lots of different analyses we did during this, um, trying to figure out stability of things. Uh, we have instrumented treadmill where we can get in the wheelchair and lean in different directions as far as possible. And this is showing you kind of where the center of pressure of the force is. But you can see in, in all the leaning we could do, we were well within the basis support of the wheelchair. So for static, it's, for static stability, it's quite, quite stable. Um, there are other tests that this, this is Eric Nickel that people can do like this and also shows that it's very stable. Now, most people with a spinal cord injury would not stand without a chest strap, but this is kind of showing you, just trying to show you how stable the chair is. Um, uh, this is sort of the, some of the things that we think are important about this ability. We, we think that it may increase time and in standing, relieving pressure, reducing pressure injuries. And then, you know, if you're taking this to the grocery store, you can get whatever you want, stand up, move around, get the things you want. You don't need help getting stuff off the top shelves. And um, there was a CBS news story where, where this guy was showing off uh, uh, his uh, basketball, quite good at basketball. So he was showing that off, which was cool. And then later one veteran actually did a layup with the chair, which actually showed the mobility and, uh, and the uh, basketball, which was fun. Uh, with VA funding, we were able to take this quite a bit further. So this is showing you a little bit, this is not the latest design, but pretty close to where we're at now. Um, where now it's on a much lighter frame. This is kind of showing the, how to get from sitting to standing. And we'll next be working on a powered standing version, but that also allows just manual mobility. So uh, what's the, yeah, this is kind of neat. You can move around your environment, get stuff off the top shelf, clean it off. And this is Steve Moore, and he did a lot of the, uh, the actual making of this device. And then I think lastly, it just shows kind of how to go back to seat, seated position and, and move out. So. What we're able to find is that um, this is the mobility and standing wheelchair seated. This is standing. So we're not getting close to like an ultralight wheelchair, but you know, it has no other parts on it other than just the seat and the wheels and the footrest, you know, and um, people can go pretty fast. But um, if you want to compare sort of the mobility of this versus an exoskeleton, this gives you an idea of sort of speed of walking in an exoskeleton. So we're <clears throat> way higher than that. Um, and, uh, and we're not quite getting there for like, you know, neurotypical walking speeds, but uh, that was before we did this. So we noticed quite a bit of compliance in this uh, top chain drive and actually the bottom one as well. So we added in this compression member between the two sprockets and had, had one of the people come back and now is able to go much faster and actually um, up to kind of the able-bodied walking speed. <clears throat> so uh, the good news on this is this, this is also licensed to a company called Levo and um, we're working with Levo, and we also have a new multi-site uh, randomized control trial that's going to, it says start in April, but now we're, that, that was hopeful. It's starting uh, October of this year instead. And um, <clears throat> we will be having half the people use a non-mobile and standing wheelchair versus a mobile and standing wheelchair. And primary outcomes are looking at utility of the chair as well as standing time. So we have a device that we can put on the chair to really monitor the amount of standing time. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, for people with SCI are at kind of a high risk for developing pressure injuries. And 
sometimes these are bad enough that we have to do a plastic surgery to really close the wound. When we do that, people have to be on bed rest for up to five weeks. So, and during that time, decondition is a huge problem. And even after they're healed, might have to stay in the hospital longer to kind of get reconditioned. So Dr. Goldish, this was another one of his projects that he wanted to work on uh, when I showed up here in Minneapolis. And so before I got here, he had already tried a couple of prototypes. One is just your standard pedal exerciser that you can find on, you know, find pretty much anywhere. And got some custom brackets created and put on this over the bed table. One of the therapists said this was the POS model. So, you know, many of you will know what that means, but basically not well liked by the therapist because it moved all over the place. And when they would put it in place for a patient, they'd have to bring a bunch of sandbags and like throw onto this. It also gives like no feedback of what you're doing. It's kind of mindless. So it really wasn't super well received. They tried to go to a uh, better table, uh, sturdier table with locking caskers, things like that. But the problem there is, you know, these are these are designed for someone in a seated position or a standing position, and not when they're laying supine. And and in most of these cases, those patients need to lay supine for literally four to six weeks. So. Um, we kind of quickly realized this whole thing just needs to be, you know, tilted on its side. So you can see the monitor, you can reach everything without hitting your arms on the table and all that. So, so um, we moved to this prototype, which was pieces from a, um, a patient lift that was being thrown away, as well as a exercise bike that was collecting dust in one of our basements. And, um, made some custom parts to kind of put these together. So this, this, this sort of shows um, that device. This one has some locking casters. And we had several, we got an open IRB for this. So our patients could try it, give us feedback. But so they could literally train with it too though and see, you know, over time, uh, did they feel it was helpful? Um, we'll skip that. We, we did a lot of testing before, before we started with people recovering after surgery. We did a lot of studies first with outpatients and looking at pressure mapping and, and um, trying to make sure that using this ergometer was not going to cause more harm than good, right? And basically from that, we found that if we can have people go at a lower speed and a high resistance, we can get a pretty good workout. So this is like moderate after about five minutes, moderate effort, and the pressure fluctuations are very low. If you try to have somebody go super fast at a very high resistance, their whole body really moves on the bed and you get all this pressure uh, moving about under the surgical area, right? So this is under their backside and this is what it looks like seated. This is during supine. And then you can see kind of the fluctuations during cycling. Um, so we did that and that really helped us to tell the therapist like keep the, keep the pace low and keep the, you know, keep the resistance high. And um, after that, we had another probably 40 veterans use this device, give us feedback. And uh, we've used it in air fluidized beds. Uh, we had to block the face, but if you can see this guy's face, he's smiling because he's doing something other than laying there. So he's been laying in his bed for about one or two weeks on his side, not able to lay flat on his back until today. And he was super happy to do this. Um, other people, we've put, we've used gaming systems on these things. And that's been really great for some patients who, who love gaming. 
they they actually exercise more than the therapists tell them because they want to finish the game. So so that's been that's been very cool. And I would say our uh, inpatient results. Most patients continue to use this while they're on sitting restrictions. Like I said, some enjoyed the gaming system. People talked about this thing as a ray of sunshine. And uh, really what we learned uh, about the device though, was that it was um, the patient lift device really wasn't too locked down on that axial um, or on the vertical axis. So the thing was fairly wobbly and that was kind of annoying to people. And, and they also said, we need something with a larger range of cycling resistances. So as you might imagine, many of, many of these people are, are very strong in the upper body. Um, and so we really needed to, to crank up the resistances. So uh, we worked on this. This was actually funded by uh, CTSI at the university for us to develop this system. And it allows fully supine exercise. You can rotate this uh, device so that you can be on either side of the bed. Uh, we've got, you can do partially reclined, seated, seated in bed. And, you know, funny enough, we did this slide before COVID. So, you know, uh, exercise in rooms with isolation precautions. Um, I mean, that, that was a thing before COVID too, but this sort of becomes a lot more relevant. Uh, after COVID, um, have very big, uh, can, can accommodate a, a large variety of, of uh, people. So this is a person who's, who's very short to a person who's very tall standing on this and um, other exercises can be done. So it's, it's got a lot of, um, it's multi-purpose. Uh, we also created an exercise game for this system and part of that the reason for that is that we want people to go at a specific pace so remember i said we want them to go kind of slow but at a higher resistance but many games uh that i showed you before are really like faster is better and so that kind of is counter counterproductive so we created a trivia game where it's monitoring the speed and if you're going too fast or too slow it stops the game and tells you to speed up or slow down. Um, <clears throat> but also as you go, you, you um, with your voice can throw balls at the answers. And so uh, we tried this with a number of veterans who liked that quite a bit. And the other thing is we added on some outcome measures. So there's a, an outcome measure called a six minute arm test where you exercise, you cycle for six minutes and then we measure the um, what's your perceived exertion uh, for the work you just did. Uh, not everyone has good grip strength, so we have other options that you can use too if you don't have good, good grip strength. And um, many people want to train for their uh, cycling, so they might have like seated cycles they use. Uh, where they actually are doing more of an in-phase cycling rather than this out-of-phase. So we have the ability to switch from in-phase to out-of-phase. And then one feature that um, ended up being pretty important to our therapists is the fact that multiple devices can mess together sort of like shopping carts because um, space in any facility is at a premium. So um, the fact that you could have many of these kind of put together is, is a good feature. Uh, this one's also been licensed. It's, um, it's licensed to a company in Minnesota called Action. And uh, the website uh, shows more movies about this and, and like uh, how to purchase the device. And then the last one I'm going to show you and then take some questions is the SkinSight camera. Uh, this is really kind of like a camera on a stick. So you'd say, hey, it's a, it's a uh, selfie stick. But the difference between this and a selfie stick is that um, 
for the selfie stick, your monitor is also way far away from you, right? So this one separates that. The monitor is up here where you can see it. And <clears throat> this was primarily developed for spinal cord injured patients as well. So they can do skin screening of the backside. And, uh, but it's also important for veterans with diabetic neuropathy who are at a risk for amputations. So uh, many, many, many of these people, both of those groups, we just give them a long handled mirror, but uh, specifically for the SCI patients, it's almost impossible to see a whole lot with the mirror. Um, and even if you saw something, you can't sort of take an image, send it to your clinician, anything like that. So, um, so this has also been licensed to a company called Paratroop. It's a veteran owned business in California. Um, very excited about it. And right now our group is, we're doing kind of beta testing or pre-commercial pre version testing uh, in both veterans with spinal cord injury and with diabetes. And that's being led by Chris Olney, our uh, nurse scientist. And it basically shows to the, let's see if this will pop up or not. <clears throat> yeah, this is sort of more where it's going now. Um, And yeah, this gives you an idea of like, you know, how are you supposed to see this? You're trying to do skin screening on the back of your head. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a trick. Uh, that's, that's difficult. So this is uh, kind of showing you the device. And this one is in pre-release right now, but hopefully coming out will be fully released pretty soon. So um, yeah, that's, that's it. I want to do this slide first and then go back for the questions. But I think our group really likes this, this cartoon. We are very much uh, trying to find the right tech. I don't know if we always do, but I love this not high tech, not low tech, but just the right tech. So um, that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. I've got a question along the lines of that last slide, actually. Yeah. Um, do you see any of the sort of fancy highfalutin tech solutions that are starting to come out of academia getting close enough to be usable for you? Or are you still really, because your, your solutions are very mechanical and they're really good designs and they're extremely mechanical. Um, do you see anything that's starting to tempt you to coming out of the sort of high tech side of things? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's always, yeah, I'll give you one, I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a power, there was a powered ankle that came out. Yeah, there's a lot of research that says, well, do you need a powered ankle for walking? You know, um, my research suggested if you want to work, walk really fast, you need it. If you want to walk normal speeds, you probably don't need it. If you want to, you know, um, and people could certainly run on pieces of wood, honestly. Uh, but the, the thing that changed my mind on that was, they fit one here and the veteran said, sometimes my family goes to the mall and I stay home. I think if I had this, I'd go with them. So that's the key. So if you're making something that changes someone's ability to participate, then I'm in, I'm on board, right? So um, now the issue with those things too, though, is we fit several of them. And like say when the batteries wear out, it's super heavy and it's at the end of the limb and it's like a boat anchor. And, and they basically get rejected over time has been our experience so far. So, so at the VA, you know, I don't wanna give the impression we don't try these things that, that come on the market because we, we do, we try clinically try a lot of things uh, like powered ankles, powered knees. Um, yeah, more work is needed to really get them to that kind of practical use scenario. So I don't, I don't know if that, that answered your question or not. Yeah, it's a, it exactly does. I was just curious if anything was getting close enough. So then uh, one more, and then I'll let someone else ask a question. Sure. Um, given the just huge psychological and sort of experiential component to your work, how, how do you quantify and measure that 
in your design so you know what you actually have to change or improve? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, so we use a lot of qualitative research methods and we have, we have experts in qualitative research methods, but you know, we also have several you know, quantitative outcome measures that are related to acceptance of a device or you know, like the Quest is an example of um, sort of satisfaction with a device. So we, we often like to start with sort of like outcome measures that are already existing, people, people have used, people, you know, sort of like standard outcome measures to get a sense for where someone is with a technology. But then we like to use qualitative interviewing after that to try to understand more about the features, you know. Best deals of the season at the Hyundai Getaway Sales Event. Get like, like, hey, I hate this thing. You know, they, they take the quantitative outcome measure and you can tell they hate it. So now let's talk about why you hate it, right? And I think that's where you really learn a lot about the features of your device and the things that need to change. You know, you, you learn more about your customer requirements and your customer requirements change based on these, based on these stakeholder feedback from, from users. So um, I don't, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, your designs are very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? There was one in the chat, um, which was, are you planning to add other exercises besides cycling? And yeah, we, we actually would like to do that. We've, um, our patent is pretty broad in that it covers more about bringing the exercise to someone over a bed. So, so it would be straightforward to do other things like rowing, um, bench press, uh, even things that are trying to do like both arm and leg movements together. I think that's, that's of high interest to a lot of our therapists. Um, the only thing is like for the for that specific patient, you just try to find the right patient and I guess the right group of patients because, you know, um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we've thought about. And um, the other question there is, uh, what about the iBot for Mobius Mobility? Yeah, this thing's awesome, okay? I, this iBot thing is very cool. Uh, I'll tell you that I, I was able to go to DECA maybe uh, 12 years ago, something like that. And um, actually talking to them about the slope adaptive foot, uh, which, which uh, collaboration never took off with them, but was able to try the iBot back then. And I know Mobius has made you know, several improvements to it since then. Um, I think it's, what I hear from the therapists here is that that version from before really, wasn't practical because a lot of the feet, a lot of the things, a lot of the details of the seating and positioning and the, uh, that really needed to be in the device for their patients wasn't there with that. Um, but now I think that's coming around quite a bit now with the Mobius version of this iBot chair. So yeah, if others don't know about this chair, it's you know, that, that it's sort of like can pop up on two wheels, like in, in it's uh, made by the same group that did the Segway. So it's, you know, you kind of lean and it'll move and, and, it, and it can do many other things like the terrain that it can go over is quite, quite exciting. So I think it's a really cool device. And the other thing that's pretty recent is that Mobius actually donated several iBot chairs to the VA so every SCI center uh, at least had the ability to get a free iBot chair. So I think we have one here now. Um, so it is a pretty amazing chair. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very amazing. So. Great. Any other questions or? Andrew, I have one. Yeah. So. 
is it fair to characterize you as a, a believer in the more mechanical design and less software, mm -hmm. um, which was actually how most of us were trained? Or, I mean, if you look at, for example, at a lot of devices these days, a lot of emphasis and a lot of effort is placed on the software, very little in the mechanical design. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the ones I showed today are products that we've kind of, you know, gone all the way with, right? So I kind of wanted to say, you know, development translation, I wanted to made by made, you know, play on the, our name of a but we also have products that we're developing that include motors, control systems, software. Um, you know, one of the projects that Dr. Olney is leading is a system, is a pressure mapping system for wheelchair users, for example. And so a lot of software going into that device. So, so we have you know, we have many different engineers in our group. We have a software engineer, electrical, mechanical engineers, bioengineers. So we do have that. We have another one that is a, um, a wheelchair design uh, that includes a caregiver support motorized system. And I think that one's most relevant maybe to sort of a robotics group, but the idea is that often you'll get a patient that maybe weighs 275, 275 pounds, and their caregiver weighs about 95 pounds. So you can imagine trying to push that person around is not trivial, right? And um, so the, the wheelchair that we, we have some funding to work on and, we, and to improve a design we already have is um, sort, of like a, sort of like the lawnmowers where they're, they're push mowers, but they have like a power assist for the push mower. So, so we have a design like that that we're working on and uh, potentially looking for students to work on that with us. We may have a student, but may need one. And um, one other ankle design that does have a hydraulic locking system that's controlled by a microprocessor controlled system with sensors that kind of tells you if you're standing, walking. But, but so our lab does a, wide variety of things, uh, but I think to characterize me, I'm, I'm more of a mechanical guy, so I think that's fair. Yeah, but my point is more uh, that we often forget the beauty of mechanical design. <laughs> and we try, uh, I mean, even if you try to raise money for a company, if you come up with a very neat mechanical design, it's very difficult to raise money. But if you have a cool software uh, algorithm that uses a camera is far easier. That's that's my point. Okay, sure. And and I think that's unfortunate. And Max can comment more. I see, for example, mechanical design is is pushed more and more out from the regular curriculum of from engineering. But for robotics and for many other uh, endeavors, I think it's essential. Yeah. Well, I, I can comment that uh, we incorporate a lot of uh, mechanical systems into our robotics class through a laboratory uh, where mm -hmm. students actually learn about transmissions and the effect of transmissions on motors and loading, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I am also very impressed with your mechanical designs. Uh, for your prosthetic foot, uh, very, very interesting uh, ankle uh, mechanism. Uh, I have got to believe uh, it will make a major dent uh, in your uh, patient population. Well, thank you, it's very kind. Uh, you know, the, the slope adaptive one is, we've had six people take it home so far and many of them said, I'm not coming to the final visit because I have to give it back to you. And I think that's the best, you know, that's the best response you can get. Um, and, you know, people talked about crying because they could, they could do things they haven't done before. And that's sort of, that's sort of why we all get into this in the first place to do something like that. So 
so that that's been a very fun uh last few months for me has been kind of the response of people but um yeah uh thanks for the positive comments it's, it's really fun to to uh talk to a new group and um and of course, we're very close. So, you know, we're here and uh, we like to collaborate with many people. So keep us in mind if something might make sense to uh, work on together. And, and I, wa I want to add uh, two things. First, mm -hmm. um, um, you can, um, we are open for capstone projects. I mean, uh, there are 35 plus students who are taking this class who are, uh, part of the master's class. And the other thing I want to say, I, I would like to strongly encourage you to take the class that Max is teaching next spring, um, because it's one of the few courses where you are going to have hands-on experience. It's not only the theory, but also hands-on experience, and you are going to have some very interesting uh, robots to work with. Uh, Max, do you want to say a few words? Because people are going to start to register next week, I believe. Well, it's uh, ME5286, uh, and uh, it is now a senior technical elective in mechanical engineering. Uh, there is a two hour per week lab, uh, and uh, we have three uh, universal robots, UR5 robots, uh, uh, that uh, you will be playing with in a series of experiments. Uh, that uh, we've designed, uh, and I must give credit for my most recent teaching assistant, uh, Nick Arswald has been uh, awesome. I don't know if he's uh, listening to this particular- uh, He's here. He's there, yeah, he has just been excellent. And uh, uh, we're actually uh, just this week trying to decide how to grade uh, these different experiments uh, and get them, uh, so students walk out feeling rewarded for all the hard work. A lot of the work has to be done at home. Uh, we provide uh, simulations that you can use, and then you walk in and adapt your simulation to the real robot. So a lot of work has gone into it. Uh, and uh, you know we're looking forward to next semester when we're gonna be, uh, last year we did it in person. Uh, and uh, this year we will also be doing it in person uh, with masks and uh, we hope it'll work out. Any other questions? <laughs>